Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Barbara Will. I am the Associate Dean of the Arts and Humanities at Dartmouth. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the third in our series of lectures under the rubric, Why the Humanities Matter in the 21st Century. Uh, this lecture series is generously sp uh, sponsored by the office of President Phil Hanlon. Um, it's a three-year lecture series of distinguished speakers looking at the most pressing issues of our day from the lens of humanistic thought, values, and insight. The series is meant to showcase great thinkers in the humanities who are actively helping us envision a better, more responsible future. We have heard from Bill Derezowitz, author of Excellence Sheep on the future of elite liberal arts education in an era of increasing uh, vocationalism. We've also heard from Cornell West uh, on the idea of spiritual blackout in contemporary America and the need for engaged and empathetic critical thinking. Next year, it's my fervent hope that we'll be able to enlist Drew Faust to speak to us about her experiences as the president of Harvard. <laughs> Today, it's an honor to welcome William Bro Adams, who first came to Dartmouth, I believe, as a student at Holderness, one of the members of the audience as Dr. Ma Martin Luther King Jr. gave his Towards Freedom address in 1962 in Dartmouth Hall, just hundreds of yards from where we are now. And I just uh, listened to this address, by the way, online. It's online, and there's a transcription of it, if you ever uh, want to be thrilled by uh, listening to Dr. King speak in Dartmouth Hall. Um, in the intervening years, Bro has dedicated himself to ensuring that academic and intellectual freedoms are preserved, protected, and extended to include, as he might put it, the common good, the theme that ran through the center of the work he championed while chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities the preeminent federal agency that supports and sustains the national life of uh, this discipline. Appointed in 2014 by President Barack Obama, Bro served as chairman until 2017, and while there inaugurated new areas of research, including the Public Scholar Program, Common Heritage, Dialogues on the Experience of War, and Next Generation Humanities PhDs. Um, grants. Most recently, Bro has taken a position as a senior fellow at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, yet as a humanist with historical leanings myself, I want to reach back farther into Bro's experience and note a critical balance between dedication to the life of the mind and a life of service. Bro is a former and highly respected president of both Bucknell University and Colby College where he helped strengthen and affirm those fine liberal arts institutions. He is also a Vietnam War veteran. A graduate of Colorado College, Bro earned a PhD in the History of Consciousness program at the University of Santa Cruz, University of California, Santa Cruz, and has held as well a Fulbright scholarship to France, stewarded the Great Works in Western Culture program at Stanford, and served as vice president at Wesleyan University. In short, I sense that Bro has been contemplating the nature of American life, its energetic exploration of the public good, and private thought, its powerful advocacy of individual and communal rights for many years, a trajectory that has allowed him to shape some of the great educational debates of our time. Throughout his career, either as a public servant or a college officer, Bro has been the staunchest of advocates for the humanities, and he would, I believe, find some resonance in the words of Lyndon Johnson, who signed the NEH into existence in 1965, saying, quote, we in America have not always been kind to the artists and the scholars who are the creators and the keepers of our vision. Somehow, the scientists always seem to get the penthouse, while the arts and humanities get the basement. <laughs> and, uh, of course, that won't be true under our new dean of faculty, <laughs> but. <laughs> and what to make of our supposed position in that basement? Bro has devotedly, with thoughtful advocacy and clarity of thought, 
made the case that the humanities can help us wrestle with the deepest of our concerns, no matter where our disciplines are, are stashed. As he noted in a recent address in Texas, the humanities represent an absolutely vital way for us to understand pragmatic and philosophical approaches to some of our era's most pressing questions. With his wide experience, not just of higher education, but of what it means to know, study, and serve this country, Bro Adams is a wonderful guide to these perplexing set of questions and current contentious landscape in our country today. It's an honor to welcome him back to campus after too long away and to invite him to help us grapple, as only the humanities can, with the questions at the heart of what we study and ponder, our shared, resonant, and often contested humanity. Thank you, and welcome, Bro. <clears throat> Thank you, Barbara, for those very nice thoughts and remarks and introduction. I'm just only a little intimidated by being one in a line of great thinkers in the humanities. I'll try to, uh, I'll try to do my best to live up to that. But it's just such an honor uh, to be here, and I want to thank Barbara for the initial invitation and the help of her office, and particularly Sarah Coulter, assistant to the dean, for her help, and Charlotte Bacon, who really put all of this together from the Leslie Center. Uh, it's been a wonderful day, and much of that is due to the good work that people did in getting ready, ready for it. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful to them. And I'm really, as I said, honored to be here. Uh, my relationship to this institution uh, goes back a little bit, and I wanted to just mention a couple of the things that uh, Barbara, one of which Barbara already mentioned. <clears throat> in 1962, Dr. Martin Luther King spoke here at Dartmouth. I was a sophomore at the Holderness School in Plymouth, New Hampshire, where I started the year before. I hope he won't mind my pointing out that one of my teachers from Holderness, Bill Clough, I was here. He was also my ski coach, which becomes relevant in, in just a moment. But our headmaster, for reasons I'm not sure I ever knew or could recall, decided that the whole school should leave Plymouth on buses. There were only about 100 of us at that point in the school's history. And we came up to Dartmouth, to Dartmouth Hall, to hear this incredible address by Martin Luther King. It was a, a, a hugely important moment in my life, and I've remembered it with great clarity uh, ever since. It was an extraordinary night. And speaking of issues to which the humanities can speak powerfully and necessarily, there's nothing more important and demanding in this country right now than the topic of race relations. And that is a place where the humanities have enormous power and enormous influence. Indeed, I would dare say that we can't get our arms around that issue without the deep resources of the humanities. And my own relationship to that issue started certainly on this night, and it was memorable. Uh, there was another memorable moment in my relationship with Dartmouth. I was on the ski team at Holderness, and I've just checked this out with Bill Clough, who reassured me that at some point in my time, the team came up here and we jumped. This is the old trestle jump on the golf course at Dartmouth. Uh, it was an impressive and imposing edifice, and I assure you, utterly terrifying, as terrifying as it looks. You were brilliant. <laughs> I was not brilliant at ski jumping. We, by the way, in those days, we had to do all four events. We did slalom and giant slalom and cross country and jumping. And so this was the site of, of one of our, our meets or the, maybe the New England prep school championships, but it was uh, totally terrifying. The other uh, thing I remember about Dartmouth, um, this is Richard Eberhardt, the poet who was such a, an important presence and influence here uh, for many, many years. His son, also Richard Eberhardt, Dick Eberhardt, went to Holderness. He was a class ahead of me, and not surprisingly, the school invited Richard Eberhardt to speak at commencement in 1964. And to bring this all back together in some poetic uh, way, I remember his talk only because at the end he read a poem, and the dominant metaphor in the poem 
was ski jumping. <laughs> and he likened the moment of graduation to the moment of coming down that in-run and taking off into thin air. And for me, it was an incredibly apt metaphor uh, because about a year later, I was not in college anymore. I was in the US Army, ultimately on my way to Vietnam. But I've never forgotten that metaphor, partly because the fear of ski jumping was so deeply embedded in me by the Dartmouth jump. <laughs> so this all comes around in some uh, important and interesting way uh, to Dartmouth. My purpose today is, is, is fairly simple. I want to talk about four or five basic issues in the future of the humanities, or what I hope will be the future in the humanities, and some emergent practices and things that are happening within the humanities that I think are enormously important and promising. And I particularly want to talk about three areas within the humanities themselves, undergraduate teaching and the humanities curriculum, I want to talk a little bit about humanities research, and I want to talk some about the digital humanities. If there is time and interest, I hope there is, I'll say a few very brief things about the situation of the National Endowment for the Humanities, such an important institution and so uh, much now, I, I, I'm sorry to say, at risk, but perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that in the question and answer, and then I hope we will have some discussion about things that are going on here at Dartmouth. I had a brilliant day today, really fantastically interesting. And I have to say that many of the things I'm gonna talk about, I find already going on here at Dartmouth. So some of these things will seem sort of like old news to some of you, uh, some of them perhaps not, but in any case, um, I was very inspired by what I saw. And I think Dartmouth is well on its way toward the future that I want uh, to look at. The sources of these ob observations really come from several different sources in my own experience. As Barbara mentioned, I had a deep and powerful humanities education. I was a philosophy major at Colorado College. I went on to the now infamous or notorious History of Consciousness program at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, I discovered at NEH how widely known this program was and is, and I was a little surprised because the program I knew is not quite the image that people have out there, but it was a very powerful uh, experience in its own way for me. And then, of course, three years as chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, a great institution, and it was for me a life-changing experience uh, because it gave me exposure to the humanities in a brand new and very powerful way. I was able to witness humanities activities at colleges and universities, of course, but I was able also to visit dozens of libraries and museums, historic sites and associations, cultural institutions. I became familiar with NEH's deep practices in filmmaking and radio production and in the digital humanities, where NEH, I think, has been a leader uh, ever since the digital humanities began there about 12 years ago. At the agency, we were trying as best we could to respond to trends in the humanities, things that were happening in the field that seemed promising to us, but we were also trying to anticipate trends and to some degree to influence those trends, which I think you'd hope a national organization would do. And all of this had a tremendously powerful effect on my thinking. Uh, it made me more and more deeply aware as time went by of all of the pressures on the humanities that we all know about that I won't spend a lot of time talking about tonight, especially in higher education, I think, where those pressures are probably most obvious and severe. But it also gave me a sense of real optimism and excitement at new developments in the humanities, including some of the things that are happening uh, here at Dartmouth. It also gave me, and Barbara anticipated this, the deepest, most energetic conviction about how important the humanities are now at this time in our country and in the public life of the country. Now more than ever, we need these ways of thinking about the world and understanding the world to address the things that all of us are aware are out there seeking our address and seeking solutions. So I have a deep regard not only for the public, importance of the humanities, but the fundamental importance of ensuring the centrality of the humanities in the academy 
uh, where they live and continue in many impressive ways, but where they're also under very considerable pressure. One caveat before I really drop into the middle of this. I came from, and I have a very deep understanding of, the traditional forms of humanities teaching and research as we've known them in this country for 30, 40 years. And I am a benefactor. I'm benefited from those forms in really powerful ways. It changed my life. It is responsible for everything I've been able to do in my career. But I'm also certain of the need for very extensive changes in what we're doing within the academy, both in the teaching and curricular side of things and in the way we practice our research. And describing some of those things is really the heart of what I want to share with you tonight. I was, as I said, a product of a very traditional humanities uh, education. And we know what those traditional forms look like within the academy. In my view, most of what we have known over the last I don't know, four or five decades in undergraduate curricular matters has been driven, established, energized principally by graduate education. That is to say, we have formed the undergraduate curriculum within places like Dartmouth and all the important colleges and universities in the country, very much in the image of what graduate education has looked like in the United States. So it is principally characterized by disciplinary and subdisciplinary forms. It has been powerfully committed to what I would call periodization and what Richard Stammelman at Wesleyan University used to call the ideology of coverage. You have to cover the beginning, the middle, and the end of all of these disciplines in historical ways many times. It has tended to be a practice that has been focused on majors, sometimes I would say at the expense of non-majors and the education of all students in the university. And it has had a model of teaching that has been principally a kind of a one-way road. I've been reading very um, happily recently the beautiful memoir that Stanley Cavell wrote about his career ending at Harvard not too, not too many years ago. And I was so impressed by the way Cavell put together his sense of what it meant to be a teacher of the humanities in these institutions. And what it involved was sitting down at the beginning of the, of the summer and writing these set pieces, these enormously complicated, powerful, but difficult lectures that was the way that Cavell understood you had to be a professor of the humanities at Berkeley or at Harvard, uh, where he taught across his career. And I remember that same sort of anxiety and fear at the beginning of courses and standing up in front of big classes of students, and delivering these lectures, which of course I felt had to be brilliant. That was the kind of the model of what we were taught to do. The emergent world in the humanities, I think, is very, very different. And it has very different principles and practices. And I think this is where we need to be going as humanities teachers. We have to move beyond disciplinary and sub-disciplinary specializations and this notion of the ideology of coverage, or what I've been calling the hegemony of the graduate curriculum. The alternative organizing principles that we need to be invested in include interdisciplinarity, integration, and problem-based learning. We have to be thinking of ourselves as humanities faculty, as faculty for all of the students, not just the students we have as majors, though, they're, of course, enormously impressive. And we have to alter the classroom dynamics that we all learned in this Stanley Cavell-like world of things and proceed to new forms of teaching. Last but not least, I think we need to expand the universe, and I know this is happening already at Dartmouth, of undergraduate research. Until very recently, it was only in the sciences where you really saw profound, robust institutional commitments to undergraduate research. It seemed in the humanities that that was not possible. But we know now that it is possible. And experimentation in places like the Leslie Center with undergraduate research is hugely important. 
At the NEH, we got very interested in my time in the undergraduate curriculum, and I wanted to introduce you very briefly to a program that we started there called Humanities Connections. The point of this was to stimulate undergraduate curricular innovation at colleges and universities across the country. And we did this by laying out these grant opportunities, which were built around a framework of teaching and curricular change that included several key items. We first of all wanted to make sure that these curricular grants that we were making would fund the integration of subject matters, perspectives and goals of two or more disciplines with a minimum of one in and one outside the humanities. We also ask that there be collaboration in these grants between faculty from two or more separate departments or schools at one or more institutions. We also ask, third, that there be components of experiential learning in these courses as an intrinsic part of the curricular plan. And last but not least, we ask for evidence of long-term institutional support because we all know that innovation is great but you've got to ultimately embed it in the life of the institution for long-term consequences. This grant program is now about two years old, and I want to share some examples chosen from the last round of grant making that give you a sense of what we were seeing as we uh, funded these proposals. There was a very, this is in the very last uh, grant making round that NEH announced. There was from Mount Holyoke College a very interesting proposal meeting all these criteria that I mentioned. Rethinking inequality through a local global lens, historical imagination in the liberal arts. A very different kind of institution, the University of Missouri at Rolla. Cultural bridges, the humanities and engineering in Latin America. I think I know or knew what they were thinking about in the humanities and engineering. I wasn't sure what they meant by Latin America, but uh, I'm sure there was a very powerful component of that in, in the award, which happened after I left. Columbia University, I know this resonates here at Dartmouth because I heard about it today. Medicine, Literature, and Society, a curricular development project. This project was actually part of an effort to reform the pre-med sequence at Columbia and place within it a much more robust humanities uh, element. And last but not least, another kind of grant chosen at random, University of Wisconsin-Madison, yet another kind of institution, navigating uncertainty, connecting humanities and business perspectives on risk and reward. The Humanities Center at Wisconsin was very involved in this, shaping this grant, and it was with, in collaboration with the business school, that it uh, achieved its uh, mark. Many of these grants were both encouraged to and and committed to the integration of education and the arts and the humanities with the sciences, engineering, and medicine. I know this is a topic also of, of some significant interest here. We funded uh, a national study of the National Academy of Sciences, Medicine, and Engineering devoted to this topic of the integration of education and the arts and humanities with the sciences, engineering, and medicine. Mellon was also a major funder of that project, as was the National Endowment for the Arts. Stay tuned. I think this report is going to come out in about two weeks, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And I hope it's good, because we put a lot of money into it. Uh, but in any case, it's worth watching for. So I urge you um, to, to do that. I think this area of integration of the sciences and the humanities is an enormously promising area. I talked today about it with Dan Rockmore a little bit this morning in a very interesting meeting and later this afternoon with Dean Madden in another incredibly interesting conversation. I think it's something that Dartmouth has the capacity to do in a very interesting and powerful way. And I think it's an enormously important future source of curricular innovation at places like Dartmouth. I was pleased to see, by the way, that there are already some indications of this here at Dartmouth. I went into the course catalog and I pulled out three examples of things that seem to be on the way to integration. This very interesting philosophy and medicine course, uh, Philosophy 5, coming out of the philosophy department. A course out of, in biology, seeing nature, how Aristotle and Darwin understood nature and human society. 
and Darwin again, along with God and the literary imagination. Having taught Darwin at Stanford, I know how incredibly powerful these texts are, but these are some very good examples of things that I think are on the way to this sense of integration and that it can involve both scientists uh, and humanists in joint work. Turning quickly uh, to humanities research, uh, again, I uh, will throw up a, a straw man in terms of kind of traditional practices and forms of humanity research, which we know have typically involved specialized research on technical and highly specialized subjects, mostly published and presented in academic journals and monographs for very narrowly professional audiences and using a very narrowly professional voice. Those forms of humanity scholarship are very powerful and they will continue to have life in the future, but I think we also need to focus on some emergent forms of humanity scholarship and they are public scholarship, the seeking of broader audiences and relevance to public life, and the digital humanities as well. Barbara mentioned, and I want to just mention briefly, the Public Scholars Program at NEH. We started this in my first year uh, after arriving there. We sequestered about 20% of the funds we had to support the fellowship program, which is the major research program at NEH. It's the biggest humanities research program in the country. We were funding about 130 fellowships a year in one way or another, so we decided to spend about 20 or 30 of those in this public scholar uh, way. Our purpose in this was to encourage humanities scholars to engage broader audiences in the work they did, both by way of the choice of topic and the form of address that they were using in the creation of these works to make them much more accessible to the public. In the very first round of this, of this program, we were overwhelmed with applications. And one of the very interesting dimensions of the applicant pool was that there were a very large number of independent scholars in this program, including people like Ron Chernow, the author of Hamilton, which became, in Juan Miranda's treatment, the musical Hamilton. He used, of course, the NEH supported Hamilton archives at the Library of Congress, so this is all fits together very well. But we were able to fund an incredible round of uh, first round public scholar uh, proposals. And one of them, which is now a book, is this One World Trade Center, the biography of the building by Judith Dupre. This book came out about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's a very interesting treatment of the World Trade Center site and what came to be on that site after 9-11. And there are some other examples this is the most recent round of funding, um, a proposal by Sarah Hendren from the Olin College of Engineering, interestingly. Um, a scissor, a shoe, the sidewalk slant, disability, and the unlikely origins of everyday things. Megan Kate Nelson, an independent scholar at Link in Lincoln, Massachusetts, in US history, how the West was won and lost during the American Civil War. And Sarah Wagner, George Washington University, Washington, DC an anthropology proposal, bringing them home, identifying and remembering Vietnam War uh, MIAs. So this program has been enormously successful in terms of the demand for it. We'll see about the books and other projects that come from it. And it is, um, it is a very important and I think enduring part of what NEH will be doing in the research program. One dimension of this that is even newer and came within the context of the common good, which was the program that, as Barbara said, I started when we arrived at NEH, was a special encouragement to scholars to address what we call the grand challenges of public life. And we actually enumerated these challenges as topics of possible interest to public scholars. They included the world of digital technology, the tension between privacy and security. This was especially lively about three years ago, still is. 
legacies of war and conflict in the United States, relationships to the natural world, the topics of migration and immigration, developments in biomedical engineering, including this incredible new technology, CRISPR-Cas9. Dean Madden and I were talking about this in his office today. Is a extraordinarily powerful topic for collaboration between scientists and humanists. This technology is going to change the way we think about human nature and human being. E.O. Wilson called it the most important moment in human history. There have been a lot of important moments, uh, but this, this is certainly a candidate uh, for that award. And last but not least, something I was very interested in when I came to NEH and now seems, I don't know, insightful, I guess I would say, the future of democracy and pressures on democratic citizenship uh, in the United States. So we were trying to drive scholarly interest toward these kinds of topics through the public scholars program. We weren't insisting on it, but we were trying to drive interest uh, in those directions, and we did see some results of that. Some of these projects, are going to be expressed in new forms, unlike past forms of publication in the humanities. And I was very pleased that during the time I spent at NEH, we were able to create with the Mellon Foundation a new program called the NEH Mellon Fellowships for Digital Publication. This uh, program was aimed at scholars who wanted to start to produce their scholarly output in purely digital form. Not translate into digital, but to begin their projects in purely digital form. We were able to get one round off in this grant program before I left. Uh, we were able in the second round, which just happened, and I'll give you a sense of some of what these projects look like. Sharon Leon from George Mason University, a study of enslaved persons owned and sold by the Maryland province Jesuits, Henry Barrett Lovejoy, University of Colorado, The Liberated Africans Project, a digital publication documenting emancipation courts in Sierra Leone, 1808 to 1896, and Benjamin McDonald Schmidt, Northeastern University in Boston, creating data, the invention of information in the 19th century American state. So this too is a brand new program just out of the blocks, I think it's gonna have tremendous pro uh, promise. But one of our intentions in creating this program was to move the needle in terms of what would be acceptable for the expression of humanities research in the academic world, and particularly in the tenure process. I know this is a tough, a tough zone, but it's one I think that has to change if we're gonna change the modalities of humanities research uh, in the academy and more broadly in the United States. Some of these projects may use another product that was funded by NEA and, uh, NEH and the Mellon Foundation, some of you know about it, I know, called Scalar. Scalar came out of the University of Southern California and it is a purely digital format and platform upon which humanity scholars can build their products, uh, whether they are text heavy or image heavy Whatever they happen to be, Scalar is there to help people. And with the help of this technology, I'm going to try to show you a little bit about Scalar. When does an electronic book become an object to think with? Introducing Scalar, a new platform for scholarly publishing that combines the focus of the ebook with the rich connectedness of a website. Scalar moves beyond linear blogs and ebooks, enabling both non technical and tech savvy authors alike to create evocative online publications that explore their subjects in rich and engaging ways. Most ebooks are straight lines from start to finish, 
and even blogs are linear sequences of posts. Digital publications offer alternatives for the combining, layering, and juxtaposing of arguments that match the ways we read today. In a Scalar book, you can create multiple paths through a publication, each one designed for a specific audience. Scalar also includes tagging functionality for grouping related items together under a common parent. Unlike in a blog or ebook, in a Scalar book, these features can be applied to any type of content, giving you the freedom to structure your work in its most compelling form. If it has a web address, there's a way for Scalar to handle it. Easily import media directly from sites like YouTube and Vimeo without cutting and pasting code. The media stays where it is, so your project stays nimble. Major public and scholarly archives like the Internet Archive and the Shoah Foundation are also supported, with more being added all the time. Important topics require time and sustained attention to be fully explored, and Scalar is designed to support deep and detailed analysis of all kinds of materials. Audio, video, images, text, maps, and even source code can all be annotated in detail, and annotations are shown dynamically on the page as media are played. If you can post to a blog, you can use Scalar, which includes features designed specifically for writers working with media-rich texts. Scalar makes it easy to work with multiple authors. Each author's contributions are tracked and all versions are preserved. Invite contributors to create new content and engage with comments from readers. Scalar includes direct access to fair use ready media from archive partner Critical Commons, so you can quote copyrighted materials with confidence in the validity of your fair use claim. Scalar lets you take your content anywhere and use it to drive anything with an easy to use public API, create custom interfaces, mashups, and more. Content in Scalar is malleable. Ever tagged a poem with a video or annotated an image with an audio file? With Scalar, it's easy. Scalar supports most major video and audio formats. Wherever possible, Scalar uses native media delivery mechanisms instead of plugins, resulting in a high degree of compatibility with the iPad, iPhone, and Android devices. Designed for sustained reading experiences, Scalar also includes a range of visualizations to help reveal the internal structure and connections of your publication. Any visualization can be integrated directly into your book as the default view for a page. All these features of Scalar are designed to work together to make it easier for you to create your own objects to think with. The thinking itself is still up to you. Thanks for watching this introduction to Scalar. For more information, visit scalar.usc.edu. Alas, the thinking is still up to us. It's a good example, I think, of some of the dynamic things that are going on uh, in the digital humanities community, and it brings me uh, squarely and finally into that uh, part of the, the presentation. I would divide these projects, many of which, any, all of which I'm going to show you are NEH and many of the Mellon uh, funded uh, projects, but I would divide them all into two realms. Some of them serve as resources for humanity scholars doing research on a broad array of topics. They are sort of background information sites. Some of them are involving new kinds of humanities projects and products altogether, and I'll give you a couple of examples of uh, each category. This is the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database. Uh, which has information on almost 36,000 slaving voyages uh, between about 1520 and, I think, 1850. This was the earliest digital humanities project that uh, NEH was involved in. Uh, it is an incredibly powerful um, database, and it is being renewed as we speak. I think there was a very recent uh, grant that NEH made to the continuing updating of this incredible database. Some of you may have used this, but I'll just give you a sense of some of the functionality of this. As you see, you can search uh, 
the voyages. You can examine estimates of the slave trade and explore the African Names database with the names of individual slaves that have been gathered into this incredible compendium. Uh, when you search the database for slave voyages, you have an incredible array of choices about information, voyage identification number, vessel name, flag, uh, voyage outcomes, uh, the voyage itiner itineraries, where they went, when they went, uh, the voyage dates, of course, the captain and crew, uh, the numbers of uh, passengers and slaves on these <coughs> slave characteristics, the percentage men, women, and so forth. So it is an incredibly uh, significant and powerful uh, database. It also includes uh, some extraordinary things like this amazing animation, uh, which sort of maps and follows the slave trade uh, beginning in the very early years, 1555. And you can begin to see uh, these are individual voyages that are being shown on this um, incredible animation. And you can see that as time goes by, uh, they increase in number. If you fast forward to 1654, Seventeen hundred. You can see now some of these uh, voyages are now going to North America to the colonies, and more and more as this period of time goes by, and you get into the very heart of the American experience. In any case, uh, an incredible piece of work that came out of Emory. And, um, and uh, Harvard as well, and funded very early on by NEH. Another uh, very powerful and, and more recent project that NEH was involved in was the Humanities Common. Uh, this is a, a very powerful uh, sort of network of um, resources that humanists can use. You can post your work here. You can draw down on uh, databases of syllabi across all of the humanities disciplines. Uh, there is a, a means of sharing all kinds of different um, information. It's an extraordinarily uh, interesting and powerful database. I won't go in it because I, I fear that we won't have time. One other one that I wanted to mention, particularly because of Dartmouth's a long history and association with Native American communities in the United States is Mukherjee. This is coming out of the Washington State University, also funded by NEH and IMLS out of Washington. Mukherjee is a grassroots project aiming to empower communities to manage, share, narrate, and exchange their digital heritage in culturally relevant and ethnically, ethically minded ways. We're committed to maintaining an open community-driven approach to Mukherjee's continued development our first priority is to help build a platform that fosters relationships of respect and trust. And basically what this enables is Native American communities to, cult, to curate their heritage and to share it in this broadly uh, public and accessible way. Mukherjee, because it's a federally funded project, is, is completely open and accessible to the public. And it has amazing uh, resources. I'll give you a sense of what they are in just a second. Maybe. I kind of picked this at random. This is a, a collection of Native American composers and the music that they have placed on the, on the website. And this is a University of Oregon a contribution. Um,
you see the part of Oregon that it's from. resource for uh, indigenous communities and um, groups wishing to cultivate uh, their cultural heritage. The last uh, project I would mention, and I again won't open this up in the interest of time, but this is the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis at Stanford. Extraordinary technologies uh, for humanities research, including spatial technology, and this is the place where most of the uh, quantitative, uh, the computational uh, analysis of, of uh, literary texts is available and, and being uh, take, taken on. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, project, and I urge you to take a look at that if you're interested in further um, aspects of that remarkable expression of the digital humanities. The last thing I wanted to share with you is the work of Tracy Fullerton Tracy is a USC uh, alumnus, I'm proud to say, and she is now at the University of Southern California School of Cinema Arts. And Tracy has developed a game, a digital game, on Henry David Thoreau's Walden. And I wanted to give you a little glimpse of this because it's so interesting. Scroll down here. What if we could all go to the woods to live deliberately? David Thoreau in Walden, a game. A different kind of digital game uh, for their children or students. Let me make some final closing uh, remarks on the liberal arts and sciences. And I do this because, as I said uh, earlier, I'm completely convinced that the fate of the humanities, broadly speaking, in the academy rests in great part on the way we think about and preserve and create, really, the, f the fate and future of the liberal arts. And as we think about new forms of teaching and scholarship, we have to reimagine, I think, the purpose and structure of the liberal arts and sciences as well. I don't think it will surprise you to hear me say that in my voyages around the country for NEH, I became keenly aware that the commitment to liberal learning in much of the American Academy is, I'm sorry to say, withering. 
and that we are seeing the decline of the commitment on part of institutions <clears throat> to this notion of the education of the whole person for a life of broad and meaningful engagement across both public and private realms and communities. The causes of this, I think, are well known to all of us. We're still suffering, I think, greatly from the terrible uh, anxieties caused by the recession of 2008, 2009. Uh, we are witnessing uh, vast changes in the nature of the work, of work in the American workplace. We're also seeing, I think, particularly out in the public world, not as much in the academy, the growth of a kind of fetishism of technology and technical knowledge, which represents a huge epistemological shift, I think, in what people regard as important forms of knowledge. All of that has led, I think, to this withering, as I say, of the commitment to the education of the whole person. What is to be done about that? And what can we do about that? By the way, I don't think this is a challenge for Dartmouth for reasons that have to do with Dartmouth's culture, its institutional structure, its history, and the liberty that you have with respect to these kinds of questions, partly as a resource matter. But in other places, I assure you, it is a huge challenge. Well, I think there's two things that we need all together to do together. One is to insist upon institutional reform in places where it's needed. And secondly, and much more important for us as humanities scholars, to rethink the theory and practice of the liberal arts and sciences. As a matter of institutional change, we have to re-energize our commitment, and particularly the administrative commitment to the education of students for a life of broad engagement. This involves working with boards of trustees, it involves working with administrators who are working under a very tough regime of cost accounting, particularly in the public institutions, where this work becomes particularly challenging and difficult, but also incredibly important. But I also think as we do that, that we need to rethink the case for liberal learning in our contemporary circumstances. We look, need to look ahead to what's coming, and we need to think powerfully, as I said before, about the liberal arts and sciences. And some aspects of that include the following. Here I'm channeling the political theorist at Harvard, Danielle Allen. We need to remake this argument on three fronts. On the front of work readiness, on the front of democracy and participation readiness, and on the front of what I will call somewhat awkwardly existential readiness. With respect to work readiness, what do we know about the relationship between the emerging American workplace and the humanities. I was pleased to see this article at the Leslie Center website about an article in the Harvard Business Review that came out uh, with respect to two new books, uh, one called The Fuzzy and the Techie by Scott Hartley, and the second um, called Sense and Sensibility, What Economics Can Learn from the Humanities, written by Saul Morrison and Morty Shapiro, the former president of Williams and now the president of of Northwestern. And both of these books are arguing about the salience of the humanities in the emerging workplace, not in the old workplace, but in the one that's coming. And so I think our job as humanities scholars is to think about what are the emerging workplaces in the economy? What capacities do they demand? How do we amplify the workplace humanities related capacities in our teaching? And how do we assess their attainment in and among our students. And to say this another way, what are the key literacies of the emergent economy to which the humanities can and do and should speak? That's a heavy lift. It's a less heavy lift to talk about democracy readiness because there is a very deep tradition in the humanities that has to do with political life and political culture and citizenship Lots of traditional arguments which remain, I think, very valid. You can't have a robust democratic political culture without some acquaintance with the history of the country, uh, with its institutions and the way in which they work, with the theory of liberal democracy, and with the cultures that are constantly emerging in this country, uh, both with respect to the new cultures that are coming in to our country from elsewhere and the evolutions within our own cultural systems and structures. All of those things are essential. All of those things belong principally 
to the humanities. And that is the ground that we need to keep talking about as we talk about the public importance of the humanities. Last but not least, what I'm calling awkwardly existential readiness, maybe the hardest thing to talk about, but I have in mind the utilities of the humanities in the meaning domains of our personal life, where we all know that we face challenges every day, every week, every month, and every year, and where the humanities speak so powerfully to our moral lives and to our moral imaginations. These are all zones that we have to perfect as fundamental arguments for the humanities looking forward and not looking back on what's happened. I draw your attention in this respect to three sources of information. The humanities indicators, which I think, as many of you know, is the single most important database on what's happening in the humanities in the United States. And they're coming out in about a week with a brand new study of how humanities majors are doing out in the economy after they leave our instruction and classrooms. The National Academy of Sciences and Engineering, as I mentioned, is coming out with this study on integration. And I'm also very pleased to say that the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation has taken on this major new research initiative on the future of the liberal arts and sciences. What's going to be new about this work is that it will have a very considerable empirical component where we try to actually measure what's happening with humanities majors as they leave our institutions and go into the world of work. I think I'll preserve the comments about NEH for perhaps some question and answers, but let me uh, say again what a wonderful experience it's been being here. I hope that some of the things I've said will be stimulating of the continuing conversation that's going on here about the future of the humanities. It's an enormously important conversation, not just to the future of places like Dartmouth, but to the future of this country, which is so badly in need of robust humanities thinking, research, scholarship, and teaching in the future. Thank you very much.